Two balls and a strike to count on Taylor. Reyes fires. Swing and a drive. Deep left field. This is way back. Look the ball. Chris Taylor. What's up, everyone? Welcome into Dodger Heads Live, presented by DodgerBlue.com, part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. My name is Jeff Spiegel, joined tonight by Blake Williams. Blake, happy 11 a.m. Korean time. Have we adjusted our body clocks yet, or are we still are we still feeling like it's morning over there? No, I am still exhausted. Yesterday, I pretty much slept all day, and today I wanted to sleep all day, but here we are. Still pretty tired. I would like to complain about like having gotten three hours of sleep the night of the first game because I feel like I'm still recovering from the 10 p.m. live show followed by the 2.45 a.m. alarm clock. But um, having been to Korea, I know the, uh, the the jet lag that you're experiencing is dramatically worse than that. So hopefully by the time regular season games start up in a few days, uh, you'll be back. I mean, just big picture, amazing trip, I imagine, for you. Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was a lot at the same time, like, I was pretty busy constantly, didn't get a ton of rest out there, which I think is partly why I'm still a little tired besides for all the traveling. Just, But yeah, it was pretty cool. Probably a once-in-a-lifetime type experience, so glad I got to do it. Well, we'll see. Apparent rumors are that the Dodgers may be headed back to Japan next year, so it might be uh, might not be a once-in-a-lifetime experience, although Japan being a different place than Korea. Here's the plan for tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about the game that just finished. Dodgers beat the Angels in Game 1 of the Freeway Series. Bobby Miller looked really impressive. Uh, the guys at the top of the Dodgers order do what the guys at the top of the Dodgers order do. We'll give the update on Shohei Otani. What do we know? What don't we know? What what things are we confident in? What things are we not confident in? As he's expected to address the media tomorrow for the very first time. And then Blake and I are going to come up with some bold predictions. We've got five of them. There were six, but we both have a bold prediction, a different bold prediction about the same player. So we'll get to that one as well. We'll do just some some quick rapid fire predictions on all stars, win totals, that kind of thing. We'll get to some news and notes about the rotation and the bullpen. And then of course we will get to your questions, but Blake, let's start with the game that we just watched. The Dodgers beat the angels five to three in game one of the freeway series. The headline has to be Bobby Miller, four and two thirds, four hits, no runs, one walk, five strikeouts. This is a guy that you and many Dodger fans, all Dodger fans are incredibly high on and excited about. I know this is, we're back to spring training games that don't mean anything, but this is kind of what you hope to see out of this guy in this spot, right? Yeah, I think so. He didn't have the best spring so far up to this point. I think he entered the game with a ERA up of four, and he brought it down to 277 in this game. So pretty encouraging. I mean, it's spring training, and you can't put too much stock in those stats, but I think you still wanted to see him get those strikeout numbers up before the regular yeah. season actually starts, and kind of be effective in one of the games and he showed both of those things tonight so it's a great thing going into his next start which will be in the regular season yeah that was what i posted on twitter is as i tuned in the biggest question for bobby miller the, the thing that is maybe in between him and becoming the guy everyone sort of just assumes that he's going to be is whether or not he can miss bats we know about the stuff but if you aren't paying close attention you forget this is a guy who is striking out less than a batter per inning last season and as a result the ERA is around closer to four than it is to three. And so for me, it's can he miss bats? Can he get those strikeouts? And I'll be honest, as I watched the first inning and a half in this one, it was a lot of contact. I don't know if he had a whiff in the first five or six batters that he faced, but as the game went on, he got more confident. Who knows level of competition? I wasn't paying close attention to which guys the Angels were sending up. And yes, even if it's their opening day starter, I wasn't paying close enough attention to the level of competition. But his ability to mix in the changeup, and Steven Nelson talked about it. It's his confidence with every pitch, throwing the changeup to righties. The slider, I thought, might have been his best pitch of the night for much of the night. The fastball is not a swing and miss, but it's sort of a keep you honest pitch. And then the breaking ball he was locating. And so we'll get into this a little bit later when we talk about the rotation. But how confident are you that what we saw tonight, five strikeouts, four and two third, which again is still, that's barely above a strikeout per inning. Do you do you have high confidence that that those strikeout numbers are going to increase as this season goes on, Blake? I think they'll increase. I wouldn't necessarily say high confidence. Okay. He has elite stuff, but he hasn't shown that strikeout ability at the elite level yet. So I think he's going to improve this year, and I think he's going to do better. But we'll see if he can actually get that strikeout stuff working moving forward. And if he can, I think he can be one of the top 10 pitchers in baseball and if yeah. he doesn't, he's still going to be really good. It's just 
he's maybe won't get that to that ace elite tier that we kind of expect and hope from him. What else stood out to you tonight uh, from tonight's game? Um, the offense looked great in the first inning or the second inning. It was when they scored those four runs and then they yeah. kind of slowed down a bit there. The bullpen was pretty effective overall, except for Ryan Brazier had another rough outing, which it's been kind of a theme this spring training for him so far. And I know that's been a lot of comments in the chat about how effective Brazier hasn't been in spring this, this far. And I know we talk a lot about relievers being volatile and how you don't ever know what you're going to get from them. So hopefully Brazier can kind of turn that around and get back on track because the Dodgers kind of need him to be that guy again. Do you, I mean, we all know where you stand on relief pitchers in general. Is the spring that you've seen from him concerning or are you willing to throw it all away and say, wake me up when the season starts? A bit of both. I mean, spring training, like you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Their work, players are working on things and they're facing different batters that they would normally face. And the yeah. defense behind them is oftentimes minor leaguers playing there and not like the normal guys. So I think you want to see him be more effective. And it is a little concerning considering some of the underlying numbers he had last year. But at the same time, it is spring training. And if he starts the season with like 10 scoreless innings or something like, I don't think we'd be shocked or anything. Cause that's just how relievers go. Yeah. I've said for a guy that's played as much as him, I'm willing to discount what we've seen in the spring, because if you're a vet who's been in the league for a while, I can imagine a game like this is not one that sort of the juices get flowing in the same way as a regular season game. And so I'm willing to take a chance and say, Hey, maybe this is just a fluke and he'll be fine. On the flip side, I joked with you right before we went live Brazier's underlying stuff was not exactly overwhelmingly positive. You could poke holes in what we saw as successful last year. So it'll be a mixed bag on, I would not be shocked kind of with any outcome of Ryan. I mean, I'd be shocked if he was just atrocious, but I wouldn't be shocked if he was closer to like a four ERA guy than he was to like a two and a half ERA guy this year. Um, a couple other things that I just thought were fun. Jose DePaula, Jose DePaula makes a great catch in right field. Fun to see that. Kid's 18 years old. It's insane. And then speaking of teenagers, Kendall George grounds out to second base, or at least it looks like a ground out, and he beats it to first by about three steps, steals second. So just crazy to me to see a 19-year-old on third base at Dodger Stadium with an 18-year-old at the plate. Yeah, for sure. I mean... I think we've also kind of come to expect the Dodgers to develop those great yeah. prospects though. And we've seen a lot of young players come through their organization and they typically get time in the freeway series versus the angels here when they do their exhibition. So both those guys have exciting futures ahead of them. So it's good to see what's going to come from them and kind of got a glimpse of the future here tonight. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's shift gears. Let's talk Shohei Otani and the latest on the investigation. Let me catch us up to speed for those that maybe haven't been dialed in every minute of every day, what we know, what we don't know. And then I've got a couple of questions for you, Blake. The first, the biggest update we got today is that tomorrow, Shohei Otani is going to be addressing the media. We don't know when, we don't know where, we don't know the context, but he will be addressing the media. Is he reading a statement? Is he answering questions? To be determined, but we will get lots of information and finally hear from somebody other than the guy that may or may not be lying about everything going on in his life. That will happen tomorrow. The other bits of information to come out in the last couple of days, MLB is officially investigating, quote, the allegations involving Shohei Otani and Ipe Mizuhara. Important thing that I think some folks at The Athletic pointed out, uh, lots of people have pointed this out. I saw it in The Athletic. It does not say they are investigating Shohei Otani. It says they are investigating allegations involving him. They also point out that Mizuhara is no longer a Major League Baseball employee, so he is not obligated to participate in any sort of investigation that they do. He can say no thanks. Shohei Otani can say no comment. And who knows what happens after that? But worth pointing out those things. Outside of Major League Baseball, the IRS has opened a criminal investigation into Mizuhara related to those theft allegations. So those are kind of the key updates. The last one related to Mizuhara, I think is the most interesting slash concerning slash bizarre. Basically everything we thought we knew about this guy seems to have been made up. If you go to his bio from when he was with the angels, a lot of stuff, a lot of details, a lot of the quote unquote credibility type things that he might have in there appear to be fabricated. You see Riverside where he allegedly graduated from says they don't have a record of a student with his name anywhere in their database. Not that he didn't graduate, that he may have never taken a class there. 
In addition, he mentioned being an interpreter for a former Japanese player with both the Red Sox and with the Yankees. The Red Sox came out and said, we did a deep investigation. At no point has this guy ever been associated with or worked for the Boston Red Sox. He also said he was an interpreter for the same player during spring training with the Yankees in 2012. Well, that player didn't even make it to spring training. He failed a physical with the Yankees in 2012. And so those are our concerning, bizarre details that shed light into some things. I wanted to get into a couple other thoughts here in a second, but I'll pause there, Blake. Knowing that, the the, the, the Ipe Mizahara backstory that is unraveling as quickly as, as it's being investigated, how big of an impact does that have on how you understand think about process th this entire story yeah there there's so much going on with it like i want to be honest i don't know like where to start or what to yeah. think or it seems like every day there's new stuff that either is contradicting past information or like completely changing your thoughts on everything and yeah i just honestly like don't know much about it like to make a great case i kind of joked on twitter that like every other fan has become a lawyer and an investigative journalist or something like that like just everyone has their own strong opinions about this but i don't think we actually know enough to have any good opinions about it yeah my current belief is that it seems like otani is a victim in all of this and that's what it seems like mlb is kind of investigating and the irs is looking into so that's my take on it but yeah, I just honestly don't know enough about it to like have strong opinions on it. And especially when everything changes the next day anyways. So I think we have to wait for Otani to say what he's going to say tomorrow and see what comes from that. And then maybe we can make some more opinions based on that. But right now I feel like everyone who's coming up with their strong opinions on it, like is really just trying to take a stance to take a stance without actually knowing and understanding everything that's going on. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, you know, I, I, everything you said is fair. I think we live in a society where people want to think through things and want to process information as it comes. And and the whole nature of what you and I are doing right here is having conversation and debating. It's not finding 100% of the facts before we form opinions. But I, I think the two biggest questions that are currently out there regarding this are, number one, did Otani place bets? And number two, did Otani knowingly cover the debts of Ipe Mizahara if, if they are his um, debts. And the first question to me is, is I would say easier for me to answer. And maybe this flies entirely in the face of what you just said, but if I have confidence in anything, and I'm not saying I have hundred percent confidence, but I feel fairly confident in the belief that, that Otani did not place bets. And the reasons are a few. One is Jeff Fletcher of the OC register who covers the angels. He talked to a bunch of angels players, former teammates who all indicated Cons he said one consensus is that Otani never paid attention to other sports. So by all accounts, the bets that we have are all not on baseball and they are all on other sports. And Otani doesn't care about other sports. The second piece, Diane Bass, um, the lawyer for the bookmaker at the center of this whole thing, told the AP that it was Mizahara placing bets on international soccer, but not baseball. Quote, Mr. Boyer never had any contact with Shohei Otani in person, on the phone, in any way. The only person he had contact with was Ipe. Um, so those two pieces of information, Blake, at least lead me to feel somewhat confident that Otani wasn't the one placing bets. And I, I not not to contradict what you just said, hey, we, we, there's not much we can be confident in, but it feels like you're at least maybe not as strongly, but leaning in the direction of believing that Otani wasn't placing the bets himself. Yeah, I do feel like that's kind of fair. Like I said, I feel like Otani is a victim of this rather than like a mastermind placing bets or anything. Yeah. It's just like with everything we do know about Otani, it seems like it would go against everything we've heard and yeah. everything we've been told and like the entire career he set up for himself, like dating back to Japan. He had his whole list of like every goal he set out to achieve. And like, I'm pretty sure he knows betting on sports is against baseball's rules. So I just don't see him risking his legacy and his career for that. So I do think that's a fair take. And I would be very shocked if Otani was the one placing bets. And if for some reason he was, like there is a precedent that it's a fine for players like Jared Cozart was suspended or not suspended for betting on sports and he just got a fine. So like, I think that is the precedent there. As long as he wasn't betting on baseball, everything should be good. But it seems like he wasn't betting on any sport to begin with. Yeah, and I do think, to correct one thing, I believe baseball players are allowed to bet on any other sport that they want, so long as it is legal. 
that they're betting on those sports. The problem with a guy like Otani, if he were even placing bets on soccer, would be the illegal bookmaker piece, which is against the law and against MLB's rules. So I, I, I'm pretty sure about that. Not 100% positive, but I believe they're allowed to bet. Like if you're in a sport, a, a state, a different state where it is legal to bet on other sports, you are just not allowed to bet on baseball. Um, and I think Ipe, you know, again, whether we believe anything he said, that was one of the things he said is like, look, I'm not dumb enough to have bet on baseball. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't know. It's questionable whether or not you're not dumb enough to do anything after that. Um, the second piece, though, where I think I agree with you and that the confidence level is all over the place is did Otani knowingly pay the debts of Ipe Mizuhara? Again, the timeline on this for people that are just dropping in or losing track because it changes seemingly so often is that the original story that was given was when ESPN found wire transfers that were going from Otani's bank account to an illegal bookmaker. They contacted Shohei Otani's representatives. The representatives said that Otani had paid Ipe Mizahara's debts, and Ipe Mizahara then did a 90-minute interview with ESPN in which he corroborated the exact same thing. The next day, Ipe Mizahara went in front of the Dodgers team and said Shohei Otani covered his debts. In fact, I actually believe in one of the stories, I think it was ESPN, they said that it was Andrew Friedman who made that comment to the Dodgers team that it was Otani paying Mizahara's debts. However, at that point, Otani's camp changed their story, said he's lying about everything. The ESPN article indicates that Otani, as he was hearing Mizahara make this announcement to the Dodgers, that was when things clicked like, wait a minute, I don't think that's true if that's what he's saying. And so the biggest question, if he wasn't Otani placing bets, which we still don't know, the second question is, if he knowingly paid illegal an illegal bookmaker to cover somebody else's debts, that is still technically illegal, and that is still technically within the realm of he could be punished by Major League Baseball. So before we get into what the punishment would be, if there would be any, I'm curious, do you have any confidence whatsoever on what you make of Mizahara's story and then it changing and, and now the UC Riverside thing like I feel like this is the piece that is that is shifting sand yeah th that's the main thing for me where I just have like no clue like it really wouldn't shock me if Otani paid Mizahara's debts like unknowingly that it was illegal Otani does seem like the kind of person who would back his friends like that and so I believe he would do that but then I also kind of believe that like he also had no idea what was going on and Mizahara as not just Otani's interpreter but kind of like his manager and driver and deals right. with a lot of the business side of things like he would have access to Otani's account where he could end up sending money so like I just have no idea and we'll have to see what Otani says it's a very interesting story and like I don't want to sit here and claim like I know it and I want to make claims that are going to be proven wrong maybe in a day or maybe right in a day, like we just really don't know what's going on in the full story. So I think it is something where we just kind of have to wait for more of the facts to come out and hear more sides and let the investigation kind of play out. Yeah. My first reaction was how bizarre it was that an Otani spokesperson would give ESPN a particular story. And then 24 hours later, completely refute that story. It felt really hard for me to believe that that story would be given to ESPN without checking with Otani basically to say, Hey, is this what actually happened? That didn't make sense. However, the more I learned about Mizar and all of the lies that he has stacked up about college and interpreter jobs, etc., It does feel like at one point I said, I, I think I can trust some of what he's saying. Now it, it's all in question. If you told me that he is a serial liar that is constantly trying to cover his tracks and, and sweep this thing under the rug, I would believe it. It seems unlikely to me that Otani would have a spokesperson that wouldn't clarify with Otani. Now people would say, well, the interpreter might have been in the middle of that conversation. And did they just trust Mizahara entirely? That's all a mess. But that's the piece I don't know. Did Otani actually knowingly pay those debts? I have no confidence about. I could believe yes. I could believe no. I think there's enough reason to believe both. Which leads to the last thing here, Blake, real quick. Do you think, like, let's let's take off, him gambling off the table. If no Otani knowingly paid his buddy's debts, do you think there will be real consequences from Major League Baseball towards Otani? That's a tough one, because I don't think there's any, like, precedent for this kind of thing. I think there will definitely be legal repercussions for Otani, but, and if that happens, I think Major League Baseball would have to step in and do something Maybe it would just end up being a fine, but I think it depends on what happens on the legal side with Otani. 
which is, I don't think baseball wants to suspend their biggest star. Like yeah. they've been marketing him up like crazy. And the Dodgers are supposedly starting the next year in Japan, partly because of Otani and Yamamoto there. So like, I just have no idea how they're going to handle that and what would end up happening if it is found out that Otani knowingly paid those fees or the debt for Mizuhara. But yeah, I, I honestly don't know. I think there would have to be some kind of repercussion from the league if it was yeah. found out that he knowingly paid those debts. Yeah. And, and when I say knowingly, by the way, knowingly paid debts, maybe not knowingly illegally doing so. He might not have understood that that was illegal, um, possible. Now, legally, a guy with Otani's money and the lawyers that he'll be able to hire, there's about a 0% chance that Otani would face jail time. Technically, paying off an illegal bookmaker, I believe, could get you up to two years in prison. Um, He'll pay a massive fine if that's the case. And then it comes back to baseball. There is a provision that says like even associating with illegal bookmakers is technically within the commissioner's realm of punishment. However, I would be shocked if Otani did not place these bets himself and still faced any real consequences just because of who he is, the goodwill he has built up, how important he is to the sport and all of that, which leads to the super chat from Richard. Thank you for the super chat. He said, it amazes me how many fan bases want Otani to be guilty. National press has been 24-7 with this story, putting out information not confirmed. They want Otani to be treated like Pete Rose. Um, Blake, I, I find it fascinating. I saw somebody tweeting, like, do you not understand that if Otani goes down with this, that it will actually be terrible for the sport that all of these fan bases allegedly love? Like, they might see it as, oh, that'll be bad for the Dodgers. This will be bad for the entire sport, if the number one player, arguably the greatest player of all time, the most expensive player ever, was at the middle of and guilty of what Otani at the worst could be accused of, that would be an absolute embarrassment and travesty for the entire sport. I think that's what makes what Richard is saying here so interesting. Yeah, I definitely think that's true. But I do also think we should note that Pete Rose has a lot of other yeah. things against him that isn't just gambling that has kind of kept him out of baseball. So I don't want to compare Tony to Pete Rose, especially with Pete Rose betting on baseball specifically at all indications seem that Otani didn't bet on baseball or make any bets for that matter. But yeah, from the fan perspective, like I think a lot of people just want the attention and like they want to be the trolls saying like, Oh, Tony would be suspended. How funny would that be for the Dodgers? They just paid him all this money. But yeah, I don't think, a lot of fans realize how bad that would be for baseball as a whole. Yeah. And, and look, I'm not surprised that people want bad things to happen to the Dodgers. I'm kind of surprised that they would wish that even on a guy like Shohei Otani. You know, we've joked there have been guys on the San Francisco Giants that I have despised at times over the years. Madison Bumgarner is my least favorite baseball player of all time. Can't stand the guy. Yet there have been other Giants that as much as I want to hate all Giants and I hate the Giants as an organization, a guy like Buster Posey is like, that's fine. Like, I don't really have anything against Buster Posey. He seems like a nice guy. Um, and so for people to hate Otani to me is just weird. I get hating the Dodgers, but hating Otani to me uh, just seems bizarre. But I I'm not surprised. It's just bizarre to me. So, all right. Well, stay tuned. There will be more content coming. DodgerBlue.com right here on the YouTube page uh, tomorrow when Otani does uh, address the media. We will have coverage of that, and uh, we'll see. It might be interesting. You think he says anything interesting tomorrow? Blake, or do you think it's like a a, a say nothing statement? Um, it's a good question. I I want to lean to he's going to say nothing interesting, but at the same time, I feel like he has to give real information tomorrow, or else it's just going to linger more and create further questions. So yeah, I think he'll answer some things, but like I could totally just see him going with the say nothing kind of route too. It, it would be strange to me to schedule the press conference and then say, you know, hey, this is a private matter and it's a legal matter and I can't comment. Like, I would be shocked if he doesn't come out and, and definitively say, I didn't bet on sports and I did not knowingly pay a, a bookie. You know, like I, I would be floored if we don't have from Otani an answer to those two questions. Now, people will then debate whether or not he's telling the truth, but I, I don't see how you can't get up and say, hey, here's the deal. Here's what happened. I've never bet on sports. I want to make that abundantly clear. And, you know, the thing between me and Mizahara is a private matter, but I did never, I never paid a bookie knowingly and we'll sort the rest out and the rest of it's private. Like I could see him trying to say, here's the two questions that you all need answer. 
And as far as details, I'm not going to go into details. We're going to deal with the rest of this through the legal process, whatever. But that's my prediction. Again, stay tuned right here because we'll have content and uh, and reaction to whatever he says tomorrow. Let's get into some bold predictions, Blake. I wanted us to make five bold predictions. We did this. We did spring training overreactions a month ago. There is overlap between these two, but we have some some now that the regular season is well technically already started, but the domestic opening day is nearly upon us, Blake. I wanted to make some bold predictions. These will increase in spiciness as we go along. And then at the end, maybe we'll ask for some folks to throw one of their own bold predictions in there. I'll start with mine. And some people are going to think I'm crazy. And some people are going to think this isn't bold at all. I think Gavin Lux is going to be fine and defensively, Blake. <laughs> like, I just think he's going to be fine. I don't think this is going to be a talking point in two weeks. I did some digging in 2022. He was 11th in defensive wins above replacement among 29 second basemen with 500 or more innings at the position. He was 11th in defensive runs saved, 18th in outs above average. He He's average to above average in 2022 at second base. I know what we've seen in spring training. I think at second base, he's actually looked fine. He looked fine today. Every throw seemed to be right where it needed to be. So my first bold prediction, and you can tell me bold or not bold, Blake, but I think Gavin Lux is going to be fine defensively. If he stays at second base, which I think is the plan at this point, I think he's going to be fine. And I kind of agree with you there. If they end up trying to put him back at shortstop, I think it's going to be a huge problem again. So yeah. as long as they keep him at second base, I think it should be okay. All right. You're, uh, we'll go to you next. Your first bold prediction is what? Yeah, so I think Gavin Stone sticks in the rotation for the entire year and finishes as one of their top four starters. Okay. There we go. So talk me through, like, what what is it about what you've seen from him this spring that that has you believing that? Because when you say top four, you're big on the big maple. So that he's, you're sliding him ahead of, of James Paxton, which is another guy you like. Yeah, that is true. That's That was kind of a close one there. But I think Stone has a little more upside and probably the durability helping him there. And from this, what I've seen this spring training, like, he looks like he's back to the form of what the Dodgers thought they originally had in him. Last year, he, of course, had the bad start, which was kind of related to some an injury with his foot and some mechanical issues and tipping pitches. Yeah. And this year, he bulked up in the offseason. He added that velocity on his fastball. His changeup looks back. Like I just think he's going to stick around and kind of prove that he is the top pitching prospect that the Dodgers originally thought they had, and he should stick around for the long haul now that he earned that spot. Do you have him, like as far as long-term pitching prospects, where does he rank with a guy like Emmett Sheehan? That is a good question. I think they're pretty similar. Like okay. I know it's kind of the cop out answer there, like saying taking Scott's right in the middle kind of take there. But you said it, think, not me. You said it, Scott. That was Blake that said it, not me. I, I do think they both have a lot of upside, and it just kind of depends on like maybe who stays healthier yeah. or things like that. But I like both of them. I like Gavin Stone more last year, so maybe I'll just stick with Stone as kind of my answer there as the better long-term pitcher, but Emma Sheehan's great, and it's hard to take away from him too. Yeah, look, Stone almost made my bold predictions list. Uh, he was on my spring training overreactions list. I I'm fascinated by remembering that a year ago, as far as Major League readiness, Gavin Stone was ahead of Bobby Miller. Like 12 months ago today, he was ahead of Bobby Miller. Now, I'm not saying their long-term futures were the same, I just think it's a really interesting comparison to see how Bobby Miller, Gavin Stone, and Emin Sheehan, who I, I think are kind of clearly the top three young pitchers in the Dodgers system, how those three play out over the next two or three years. Because whereas Gavin Stone doesn't have a 100-mile-an-hour fastball or even the metrics of a guy like Emmett Sheehan, the changeup, the pitchability, that kind of stuff I think is really, really interesting. And I am super high on Gavin Stone um, he's a rookie of the year candidate. As far as I'm concerned, he may be the number two national league rookie of the year candidate among the Dodgers starting pitchers behind Yoshinobu Yamamoto. But I, I think he could really make some noise in, uh, in that race. So, um, I like that one. Let's go to number three. This is where you and I are going to disagree. At least I believe we're going to be disagreeing and that's James Outman. I am very high on James Outman. James Outman last year, 4.4 wins above replacement. For context, he was one spot ahead of Fernando Tatis Jr., and he was, I believe, one spot behind Will Smith, the Dodgers catcher, among position players. That was top 30 in Major League Baseball at 4.4 wins above replacement. I believe Outman's going to be a four-win player again this season. Um, 
I, I know that there's some concerns about the how he struggled, ups and downs, the roller coaster of that kind of a thing. Um, but I, I believe that Outman is going to be a uh, a four win player. But I believe Blake that you disagree with me on that. Yeah, I think Outman's going to end up in a platoon role, whether that be with uh, Kike Hernandez or Chris Taylor. My concern with Outman is he doesn't make a lot of contact and his average exit velocity isn't good enough to kind of make up for that lack of contact. He was 16th or 16th percentile in expected batting average, 31st percentile in expected slugging percentage, second percentile in whiff rate, and sixth percentile in K percentage. So I just don't think that has the makings of a consistent regular major league player. And those were kind of some of the concerns with Outman coming up through the minors too, which is why a lot of people projected him to be a fourth outfielder rather than an everyday player. And I think his defense is going to carry him enough to be a solid regular versus righties, but he had some struggles versus lefties. And I just think if he doesn't start making more contact or at least hitting the ball harder, he's not going to be able to sustain a regular everyday playing role. Yeah, I, this is you and I will just we see this one differently. I mean, po, I know sort of there was this narrative about his struggles and that kind of thing. He was a 2.6 wins above replacement player after the All Star break. He was actually better in the second half than he was in the first. He did struggle against lefties, 93 weighted runs created plus. So I get that. I just think defensively and his ability to 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 be a really a plus defender. I think he was like fourth um, in defensive value among guys who had a thousand or more innings pitch innings out in center field. So I just think he's going to stick out there because of his defense and that his ability to adjust against lefties will be, you know, not something that's going to be a strong suit, but I think overall he's going to be, he'll be fine. Um, so just out of curiosity, and this is a bizarre question because wins above replacement. I mean, do you see him as more of like a two and a half win player, a three win player? Where are you at on him? I think around two and a half is probably fair. I mean, he was basically a four last year, I think, if I remember correctly, playing in everyday rules. So I think if he ends up losing time versus lefties, bringing that number down a bit, it's probably fair there. Um, it's hard to say, like, he could make a jump and start making more contact and or at least hitting the ball harder. And like that could completely change my perception of him. He's still a pretty young player overall, but yeah. also like he's not at the point of the age where a player is going to keep developing significantly. Like he is, I think 26 or 27 now, yeah. 26. So like, I'm just not sure how much upside is actually still there. So that's my main concern with him. Like I just need to see either a higher contact rate or more power when he is making contact. Fair enough. Fair enough. I do see somebody in the chat, by the way, saying Gavin Stone is not rookie eligible. He has 34 days of service time. 45 days is when you cross the threshold or 50 innings pitched. He had 31 innings at the major league level and 34 days of service time. So unless I'm totally missing something or fan graphs has totally bad information, Gavin Stone is eligible for the rookie of the year in 2024. Um, all right, let's go on to number four. And this is where this is where we get a little spicier. Again, this some what you're about to say, some people believe is not at all controversial. And yet I'm sure we will have other people who think it's crazy. So the floor is yours, Blake. So I'm I've said this one throughout the offseason and I'm sticking with it. The Dodgers win the World Series this year. I think there's a pretty strong trend of teams that end up having big off seasons and spending well end up winning the World Series like the Rangers did it. I think they did it a year later, but the Dodgers already have a better team than the Rangers had at that point. And I just think they have all the pieces they need to actually go out there and do it. And we know about their postseason struggles, of course, but you got to break through eventually. They did it in 2020, and now they're going to do it in a full season. Yeah. Look, no controversy here. I mean, how close – I am I am always interested by – like the, the Braves are ahead of the Dodgers – in most people's sort of like power rankings, or even I believe odds to, to uh, like win projections, that kind of thing, which is a little different because it takes into account divisional opponents, that sort of thing. Um, but are you like, do you think, how big of a gap do you think there is between the Dodgers and Braves, if any? I don't think there's a huge gap between them. I just really like how the Dodgers would line up a rotation in the postseason if they ended up facing each other. Like, I think last now, Miller. And then whoever else you want to throw in there, like Yamamoto, probably is going to be there even after his poor start. Like, I don't think that's crazy to say that he's going to be really good still. And then maybe Gavin Stone, 
James Paxton, Walker Bueller played in Kershaw. Like you're going to have some good options for that fourth spot there. And the Braves are a little shakier after their second or third option. So I think that's where my main difference lies between them. Like both have really good offenses and a lot of star power at the top of their lineup. And I just think the Dodgers have kind of that star power now with Shohei Otani bringing a different vibe to the team, maybe that they didn't have previously and just a little more excitement. That's going to help them get through that postseason grind. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, agreement from me on that one. Last one here. Number five. I think Mookie Betts leads Major League Baseball in wins above replacement. He was second last year, but I think moving to shortstop should increase his value defensively just from a positional perspective. If you believe that he can be average to above average at shortstop and continue offensively at the pace that he was on last year. But I tend to think like this is a weird theory. And Mookie has kind of hinted at this, which is where I get it from. But I tend to believe that learning a new position and the focus that will be required for shortstop might actually help Mookie Betts stay more locked in offensively. Like it will actually keep him on his toes, adrenaline pumping, that kind of thing. So what do you think about that, that Mookie Betts, his his chances of leading all of Major League Baseball and wins above replacement? I think there's a solid chance. I, I don't think I'd pick him necessarily at this point, but like – I mean, Mookie is great at baseball and nothing he does can really shock you anymore. And especially having that ability at shortstop there is going to help boost his war a bit. But I think what we've seen with some of the other top players in the league, like it's a hard thing to go out and lead the league in war. So I think it's a good shot, but I wouldn't like bet on it necessarily. Totally. You would get incredible odds though, you know, but it's just interesting. Can Acuna repeat the type of season he had last year? Can Mookie do it while also playing shortstop? Those are, um, those are, so those are our five bold predictions. If you want to throw a bold prediction in the chat, um, we can throw some of those on the screen. As we do that, Blake, I have some more questions for you. I I'm curious how many all-stars you think the Dodgers end up with this year. As I was going down the roster, I think there's, Let's see, 11 guys that you could make a reasonable case for and a 12th that I think is probably more in play than many people believe. So let me just run through this list. You give me a yes or no on All-Star in 2024, all right? Uh, Shohei Otani. Yeah. Mookie Betts. Yeah. Freddie Freeman. Yes, but there's some good first basemen that could kind of push him off, especially with how crowded the Dodgers are, but I think it's pretty safe to say yeah. Okay, Tyler Glass now. Yeah. Uh, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. I'm going to say no, even though I think he can do it, and he probably will be in the running. But I think the Dodgers having so many all-stars and the National League having a lot of really good pitching is probably going to push him off. Okay, Bobby Miller. I'm going to go no for the same reason, but like I think he also has a really good shot. Okay, Evan Phillips. Also, no, because he's not as known, but like it's going to be one of those things where it's like he should be an all star, but he just doesn't get it because like the Pirates need their reliever to make the team or something like that. He, he could get end up with a ton of saves this year if they use him in more of a traditional closer role, which could help his case. Uh, Will Smith. Yes. OK, so that's five. Um, I think the next three or four guys. I know James Outman's on this list, so I'm going to cross him off before we even ask you that question. Teoscar Hernandez? No. Okay, some people are really aren't you're are you really high on him? I like him and I think he's going to be a solid player. I'm just not sure he's going to be like all-star level where he makes a team as like the 7th Dodger to make it. I think that's kind of tough. Yeah. Okay, so we're at 5. Um the other two guys that I, I would say are not likely, but I wouldn't be totally shocked would be Max Muncy and Gavin Lux. And that's just because of the positions they play. And if you told me that Gavin Lux played competent defense and was like a 115 to 120 weighted runs created plus guy for the Dodgers, I, I could see it happening. So I'm guessing you're a no on both Muncie and Lux. I think I'm a no because like Nolan Arenado is going to win the fan vote or Austin Riley. And then the other one's going to get the other nomination. Like as the Cardinals representative, if it's not, and then with second base, I think Albies is going to get the nomination and then, probably like a tell Marte ends up getting the other spot there. So I think it's just a tougher path for them and they would have to really kind of light it up to make the all-star team. So we're at five, but you're a strong maybe on Yamamoto, Miller and Phillips, I believe. Is that fair? 
Yeah, I think that's fair. And that's mostly just due to like how many all-stars can actually come from one team and not necessarily like if they deserve yeah. it or not. Okay. I, I, I think I agree with your five. So we've got Otani, Mookie, Freddie, Glasnow, and Will Smith as five yeses. Um, I'm with you. I, I would not be shocked if Yamamoto, Miller, Phillips, if there's one more from that group. So I would put those six as I think the Dodgers get six, um, five. I feel good about the other from, from a different sort of pocket. So, okay. Let me give you a couple more predictions here. Uh, Pakoda has the Dodgers at 101 wins projected. I'll set the over under at 100.5 regular season wins. You taking the over or the under? You said 100.5. So this is how betting works. You don't you don't put it at a full number because you take the over. Uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. I got that. I'm just saying like that seems really low considering they won 100 last year. And so Pakoda Pakoda has I don't know if you heard Pakoda has yeah. 101. Projection systems are really conservative though. So like if you're setting your own, I'd go a little above that. So I'm definitely taking the over on that. Okay, Bobby Miller over under 3.25 ERA. I'll take the under. Okay. So talk me through that. He was a 3.77 guy last year. So that's a pretty significant jump. And 3.25, there's not a ton of guys that go under that number. Yeah, I just think he has the kind of stuff that he needs to do that. I've been saying I think he's going to take a jump all off season, And I just got to kind of stick with that, especially if he gets the strikeout stuff working more. Like, I think he has all the talent he needs to be a top 10 starting pitcher in baseball. Just about putting those skills together and going out there and doing it. Uh, DraftKings, by the way, has the Dodgers at 103.5 is the line, but it's plus money on the over. So basically they're saying the number is closer to 103. So 103.5, are you still taking the over? I think so. Okay. I think we're going to have some fun this year. What's that? We're going to have some fun this year. I like it. I like it. I, I, I'm taking the over on Bobby Miller, 3.25. I think that's just a really big number. And until I can be convinced that the swing and miss is there, I think it's, it, it could be trouble. Um, not trouble, but but harder for him to get under is what I mean. Uh, Otani, over under 49 and a half home runs. I'll take the over. I okay. think if he stays healthy, I think he was at 44 last year with 130 games or something yeah, around that. Games. So, yeah, if he stays healthy, I think he hits the over. Okay. Um, 3.25, I just looked this up. So there were 10 pitchers last year qu who qualified with a 3.25 or under ERA. So for some context there. Um, and, and some guy like Corbin Burns was at 3.4. Zach Allen was at 3.47. So um, a, a lot of good players that are that are coming there. But um, okay, last two more here. Yamamoto, eligible for Rookie of the Year. He is the favorite, according to Draft Pink Kings. Yes or no, National League Rookie of the Year, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Yes, I'm taking it. Okay, all right. Uh, and then home run leader, Otani, you've got over 49 and a half. I'm with you. I've said before, I think he's going to hit a big number. Who do you have leading the Dodgers in home runs besides Otani? Last year, Mookie had 39. Muncie had 36. Teoscar, who some people think is going to hit a million, has 26 as well. Uh, Mookie, Muncie, who you got? I want to say Mookie because I feel like that's the easy answer. But like Muncie could kind of shock and maybe hit one more than Mookie or something this year. Is Muncie allowed to hit that many though? Isn't he? Doesn't he hit like the same number of home runs every time it feels like? It seems like right around that like 33 to 36 mark he's always at. So I think he's been at 35 twice and 36 twice. <laughs> and and that's in the last six years with one of those being the COVID year. So it was 35, 35 COVID year, 36, 21, 36. Yeah, he's going to he's going to get to 37 this year and Mookie wow. finishes with 36. OK, look, yeah, I mean, he could hit 36 and that could be the, the second best mark because guys like Will Smith, Freddie Freeman, those aren't huge home run number guys again tay oscar would sort of be the wild card in that mix that it just he goes off sort of a thing but um yeah interesting stuff there so um i saw i saw one bold prediction which is the expected one that ryan brazier wouldn't last very long that he's a month a month into the season do you think do you think there's a chance ryan brazier is cut by the dodgers by the end of the season i think there's a chance i mean he was a guy who was dfa'd by the red sox not even a year ago, I think, at this point. So, like, I think there's definitely a chance with how volatile relievers are and how many options the Dodgers have in their bullpen. So, yeah. I think it's definitely going to be based on his performance, and it wouldn't shock me if they move on at some point if he doesn't perform. Okay. Hawaiian Kira, thank you for the super chat. She wants to know, how many Dodgers in the 30 home run club, how many in the 40 home run club? So, we both got 
We've both got Otani over 50. So we've got one Dodger in the 50 home run club. They had none in the 40 home run club, although Mookie Betts got to 39. So is is anybody joining? Well, I guess you kind of just answered this question because you have Muncie leading the team non-Otani with 37. So you've got nobody going over 40 outside of uh, Otani? Yeah, I think that's probably my fair take there. Like, Muncie. What about Willie Adamas? When he becomes a Dodger and you and Scott are Scott's tweeting about three home runs in spring training. Are we we're taking the over. He'll get to like 33 with yeah. elite defense and we're all going to be happy. So how many guys over 30? So uh, Muncie Mookie are, are safe bets there. And then I think you've got the Freddie Freeman, Teoscar Hernandez, Will Smith crew as you know, it, it, it seems like it's at least in the realm of possibilities. How many did Freeman hit last year? Was he at 30 something? I think it, it was right it, now. I think it was 20 something, 29, 29. Okay. So that makes it a little tougher. I'm going to say three and I think it's Muncie Betts and one of Freeman or Tay Oscar. Okay. And so four, cause you're including Otani in there, even though he's going to be yeah. in the, yeah. the 30 plus club. So, so who are the two you've got as the, as the, the one of these two Betts and Muncie. Okay. Um, so you've got Betts, Muncie, and Tay Oscar, you said? One of Tay Oscar or Freeman. Got it. Okay, okay. That was the part. Oh, uh, Outman had 23. You're down on Outman. Will Smith only had 19 last year. So those guys would be uh, – I wouldn't I wouldn't expect to see either of those. But, um, yeah, I, I think I'm with you. I think um, Mookie, Muncie, Freeman – I'll go four. And, and Tay Oscar plus Otani. So five Dodgers with 30 or more home runs. Of course, of course, we're also projecting perfect health for all five of those guys in order for that prediction to come true. So uh, we'll see. Um, how that one plays out. All right, let's get to a couple more news and notes here, and then we'll move on to some questions. I see some people already asking about some Korea trips and that kind of thing. So uh, we'll, I'm excited to get into that. Um, news and notes briefly here, rapid fire stuff. The rotation has been set, and Bobby Miller's in the number two spot. Gavin Stone is in the number four spot. So Yamamoto goes from number two to number three. Paxton, who many people had penciled in to go four, is fifth is an old segment a throwback segment big deal or no deal here blake i'm gonna say no deal there like i think it's just about getting them rest and lining it up how they think it's gonna work out best like with their health and keeping their innings to a certain point that they wanted to so I, i'm not reading too much into that it's just about getting them on the right track yeah I, I, I totally agree. Once the season starts, if you're not the opening day starter, it genuinely does not matter if you're two, three, four, or five. It could be based on matchups. It could be based on, um, you know, time ga game times for the first week of the season, whatever. So um, I, I don't think neither of us believes, Blake, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that this is an indication of a change in belief about Bobby Miller or a change in belief about Yamamoto or Paxson or stone, right? Like it, this is purely sequencing and has nothing to do with a internal ranking. Yeah. They're, they're not changing any of their predictions on any of these guys. Like even with Yamamoto's bad start, they're not like changing their tune on him Yeah, because of that. After giving him 325 million, it's just, just about setting them up to get the rest that they want them to and their sequence going into the season. All right, bullpen wise, JP Fireyes and Gus Varland, Landon Knack were optioned, which means Michael Grove, Alex Vessia, Kyle Hurt grab the final three spots in the bullpen for domestic opening day. Um, in part because Blake Trinan and Bruce Dargraderall will both open the season on the injured list. Any surprises or reactions to that group? Not really. Maybe a little surprised about Fireyes and he seems like a guy that they've liked a lot, but I think we've also talked about it before, like he hasn't pitched in so long. It wouldn't totally be surprising if they yeah. sent him down to get some extra work in AAA before bringing him back up. Landon Knack was a guy who wasn't going to make the team really besides for the injuries. So yeah, I, I'm not surprised with any of those. Hurt is the interesting one just because they keep saying that he is a starter and yet they're keeping him in the major league bullpen and presumably, I, you know, I guess if I, I guess if they needed a sixth starter, maybe he's higher than Grove and Yarbrough. I don't know. That would surprise me a little bit. But um, I think he's definitely one of the best relief pitchers they have in the organization today. I, I guess I was just a little surprised that they're willing to sort of let him pitch exclusively out of the bullpen, given kind of what they believe about him long term. Um, a couple other news and notes. Andre Lipsius cleared waivers. This was a guy acquired 
Somehow, I don't even remember how at this point, by the Dodgers, he was uh, uh, DFA'd and cleared waivers. So he was outrighted to Oklahoma City. And then uh, our guy, Scott, J.D. Martinez, headed to New York, to the Mets. They, they want a veteran bat in the lineup there, Blake. And uh, he, he also had an interesting quote about the reason he didn't go to San Francisco was because he didn't like the way that, that his numbers might come out in that park only to have some analytics people saying uh, your numbers aren't going to be any better in New York than they would have been in San Francisco. So any of that stuff interesting to you? I thought you were going to say the actual funny quote of JD saying he's addicted to going to the playoffs and then he signed with the Mets. Oh, I did not see that. That's amazing. Yeah, that was getting trolled a lot on Twitter, (laughs) like people saying he's going to go cure his addiction in New York. (laughs) It's amazing. It's amazing. So any other thoughts on, on Lipsius or JD Martinez or any of that? Not really. Like, if we see Lipsis at some point in the season, it wouldn't surprise me if he comes back, like, added onto the 40 man when a guy gets put on the 60 day. And JD needed to find a home soon. So, yeah, nothing too surprising there. All right. Let's get to some questions here. Before we start, I'm just curious. This was a trivia question. I asked you, you said you're not a trivia guy. I did terribly on this. So, this isn't meant to put you on the spot. Maybe some people in the chat will have some fun with this. But, um, I, I saw, I believe it was John Boy who did a video that was, uh, he was having a friend guess, can you name who has made the most opening day starts at each of the various positions for the franchise? So in, in our case, I looked it up for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Do you have any guesses for at each position? So catcher through outfield and then starting pitcher. How many, how many guys do you think you could name who, who would have the most opening day starts for the Los Angeles Dodgers at that position? So we're not including like Brooklyn history. Brooklyn's there. not included. Just just since coming over, I believe 1958 was the first season in LA. Yeah, I have no idea how many I could get, but I can guess. Okay, go for it. Let's hear it. Um, start with catcher, I guess. Um, okay. Steve Yeager, maybe. Nope. There's a tie. This one's a tie. Mike Sosha and Johnny uh, Rosebro, nine apiece for those guys. So there you go. I have, I have no clue who Roseboro is, going to be honest there. So okay, that's perfect. Never it's great. That. I called my dad with this, and my dad got every single one of these except for one, which is the least surprising thing about my dad. But um, yeah. So, okay, first base. Garvey. Mm, good guess, but you could get this Keros. one. Keros. Nine for Keros. So he, he edges out Garvey at first. Um, second base. Um, Davy Lopes, Davy Lopes, seven. Here we go, Blake. You're, you're catching speed shortstop here. This guy is tied for the most of any position. 11 opening day starts. Is it Bill Russell? Bill Russell. Okay, here we go. The infield is actually fairly yeah. easy once you get past Carol. So third base, who you got? Say. Say, correct. Okay. Outfield is where it gets interesting. At least I would have had no hope on two of these three, but uh, any guesses for left field, right field, or center field? Yeah, I was going to say like Andre Ethier, but if you're saying Andre no, Ethier is correct. Okay, okay. Right field. That's the one that my dad could not guess was Andre Ethier. Six starts. So that's of all the positions. That's the lowest number. Ethier has had six. They have nobody else who started more than six times in, uh, in right field. So I believe Puig is second on that list at five, which would have been amazing if the answer to that question was Puig. Okay. Left field or center field? I probably have no idea if you're saying like you never would have guessed it. So Dusty Baker was in left field. And never would have guessed that. Willie Davis in center field. So Willie Davis, 11, tied for Bill Russell. Um, but yeah, again, a- an older guy. So um, And then starting pitcher. You want to take a guess at starting pitcher, which Dodgers made the most opening day starts in Los Angeles? Uh, I'm going to say Kershaw, but I feel like you're going to totally surprise no, me. It's, it's not. a good guess. Nine, nine opening day starts for Clayton Kershaw. Uh, I think I'd have to go back and look. There was maybe it was Drysdale. There's somebody else who had eight. So um, anyways, but there you go. So Sosha and Roseboro tied for nine at catcher. Caro, Slopes, Russell, Say, Baker, Ethier, Willie Davis, and Clayton Kershaw. So that's impressive, Blake. For for a non-trivia guy, that's uh, that's pretty good. So um okay i see people saying sutton it might have been sutton that had eight um but there was nowhere that had this answer for me i had to actually go to like the baseball reference page that had every opening day lineup and just like count so if i'm wrong on any of that i apologize um all right let's get to some questions i just buried all the questions we have here we go tqt 
What do you think Yamamoto's ERA will be at the end of the season, Blake? 3.18. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're still saying like a top 10 guy. Yeah. Okay. Did nothing change? Like, I mean, like I'm not expecting dramatic, dramatic, uh, like reversal of opinion. I'm just curious, like totally 0% concerned. Yeah, I have like no concern whatsoever. First start yeah. in Korea after all the Otani stuff is coming out. Like I just, I'm not putting too much stock into that. Okay, fair enough. Uh, GI wants to know, do they make a major trade before the deadline? And if so, for whom? This is on a platter for you, Blake. So go for it. Uh, Willie Adamas. We're still going with that one. Okay. All right. Um See, I know there were a couple other questions that I buried by asking other stuff. Oh, here we go. Michael wants to know about the DMZ. I did go. Zone who are unfamiliar, the space between South and North Korea. I did go. It was pretty cool. Um, it was a long day. It ended up being like a nine-hour tour in total. Um, we went now, to which like, version. There's different. There's different kind of versions. Like, do you go to the Peace House? Is that still open? I don't think so. Okay. So what um, to talk? What 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 was the DMZ tour that you went on? I think it was the more minimal one where, like, we went to the observation okay. point. There's two of them actually. Like one, you could actually go look into North Korea, and then there's the observation point to look at the. I think it's the Unity Bridge or whatever they call it, the one that was built between North and South Korea. There, um, we kind of drove through like the uh, minefield that they have in the DMZ from where I guess North Korea was planting them, and they haven't found them all. So, like, there's a path with fencing around it. So, like, you can't drive through the minefield, actually. But, like, you're off to the side of it on the road there. So, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, we went to one of the tunnels that North Korea was okay. digging under the DMZ to try and get into South Korea. Um, and then we went to one of the villages inside the DMZ. Nice. Yeah, so the, I've done the DMZ. I've done two. The second time I did the exact tour that you just described, the tunnel, and it's got the little cart that you get to ride back up or whatever is a sweet deal. The first time I went to South Korea, you could actually go to like the military section and they have what's called the peace house. They have these like three little buildings that literally straddle the North Korea, South Korea line. And what's fascinating is at the time, North and South Korea would like take turns on who could have tours in the, in the thing. And it's wild. And so that was the first one I went, but that got closed. This was like, I don't even remember seven, seven years ago. And then it got closed because stuff with North Korea ramped up. And so, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy stuff. I think it closed because a few years back, someone like ran into North Korea and then yeah. he was like a political prisoner there. So that's been shut down since. Makes sense. Makes sense. They did tell some stories of people from North Korea trying to make a run for it into South Korea in that context. And um, you can imagine those things did not go well um eb wants to know did you give up on korean food and get american fast food while in korea here it is blake here's the question that people want to know yes but also it's because the games ended at like midnight when i finally got back to the hotel and everything was closed so like mcdonald's was the only thing open near the hotel so that's just kind of what i had to settle for or else go without eating well and tell us about mcdonald's you were all excited to try some unique thing that they had only there yeah, I got the uh, chicken sandwich with the mozzarella sticks on it, and it was pretty good for McDonald's standards, but, like, it had some spicy sauce on it that I didn't really like. Was it not, like, a pasta sauce? Like, not a marinara kind of a deal? It was some kind of tomato-based sauce, but it was spicy, so I don't really know. I love it. I love it. Uh, what was the best thing you ate over there? I like that spiral potato thing from the street vendors a lot. I like potatoes a lot. I think yeah. we've talked about fries and all that on here. So the potato thing was good. Was there like a act? Was there a Korean dish or Korean food that you liked? Um, is, are we not counting that as like Korean? Well, food? I mean, that's like fried potato. Like it's not exactly the national dish. Yeah, over there. but like I, I don't, I don't like spicy foods or seafood. So like my options were kind of limited. You did do Korean barbecue though, right? Yeah, I got the chicken. I thought it was okay. okay. Like, I didn't think it was as special as like I was expecting it to be. I guess maybe people hyped it up too much. Okay, it was Fair okay. Enough. Okay, Dave wants to know the Dodger heads origin story. Uh, there's not a crazy story here. The only funniest funny part about this is uh, Matt Moreno reached out to me. I had been writing for the site for a while in 2020. Like, hey, what do you think about starting a YouTube show? At the time, it wasn't a podcast. I was like, sure. 
So it was me, it was Matt, and it was Daniel, which is we have the old logo that you see before everyone that is just me, Matt, and Daniel. That's because originally those are the only three people. The irony is we started it. I can't remember if it was right before COVID or during COVID. It, it, we started it like within a month and a half of starting this show, <laughs> baseball shut down. So that was the origin story of us doing Korean baseball content and that kind of thing on here, which led to a whole other thing about there was a the first Dodger heads viral moment took off in Korea. <laughs> There's a clip from one of our shows that has like 500,000 views in uh, uh, talking about KBO. So that was the origin story. And then as the site has grown and people have come in, come in, people like Blake, people like Scott, we have added obviously to our team of folks. So um, that's the Dodger heads origin story. The name is just bobbleheads with, uh, with Dodgers in there. So um, yeah, uh, there we go. GI wants to know, will Blake or any of the DB crew going to Japan for the 2025 season opener? It's not official yet. I don't think right. Blake. Yeah. It's not official from everything we know. So we can't confirm anything until we know anything. And even then we'll probably know for sure closer to the actual season. Yeah, because you found out about, that you were going. I mean, because the thing about these trips is there's like booking the flights and all of that kind of thing. But the most important thing is actually getting cleared through Major League Baseball to be credentialed. And they don't get that information out to you until like, what was it, three weeks before the game or something like that? It was probably a month before, but yeah, I was cutting it kind of close. Okay. Uh, NS wants to know, did you eat a live octopus for the content? No, no. I did what accidentally the eat the that you were squid. freaking out about? The squid bowl thing snack, like the squid with the peanut in it. And that was like the worst thing I've ever had. I, I did it come? I, so I, I didn't get to see this. Did it come in like a, a snack bag? Yeah, it was like a bag of chips kind of thing or something. And I thought it was those hazelnut bowls that the Dodgers had and were trying. Okay. Then I tried one and like, I was like, this is not good. And then like the aftertaste hit me a few seconds into that. And I looked at the bag and I saw a squid on the back, like a tiny little one. And then I saw comments saying people like that's a squid snack. And yeah, no, it was not, not good. Your favorite. Uh, people asking, uh, Hawaiian Kira, did you get Korean fried chicken? I looked, but I didn't find it. Okay. So, did you go um, to Myeongdong? I did. The, I went there. It was packed. And I feel like you could hardly walk around there. Like it was worse than Disneyland type stuff. The there. So, yeah. So like, I kind of just got a little sick of it and left after being tired from all games and practices and stuff. So Fair. I may not have given it my best effort to look, but I did look. Okay. Uh, William wants to know who hits the next Dodgers home run tomorrow night. Hopefully. Wait, are we talking right? Well, I guess. Okay. He's talking freeway series. So we'll go freeway series. Um, I have no idea. James Outman, just for the fun of it. There you go. Now we're talking, Blake. Um, I will go Mookie Betts. He almost hit another one. Do you? Would, who would you? Would your answer change dramatically if we were talking Major League regular season? Yeah, I probably wouldn't pick James Outman. Okay. Um, we got some people in here that were not happy about your uh, chicken choice for for Korean barbecue, but you know, um, there we go. You know, it's if you know, Blake, this man is chicken through and through. The only time I've ever seen him not eat chicken was at a steakhouse. So and that was I won't say pulling teeth, but it was uh, there was probably a little bit of peer pressure involved. Is that fair? Yeah. Did they even have chicken there? <laughs> OK, fair enough. I have no idea. I don't know. The irony, of course, with that story is that Blake ended up ordering the most expensive steak of anybody at the I, table. I went with the recommendation I was given. It's fair. It's fair. Um Let's see. Um, some more questions. T -t 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 -t. No kimchi. Did you try kimchi, Blake? I did not. Okay. Okay. Um, here we go. TQT. How confident are you with Muncie's defense? There are times when I'm shocked he fields anything cleanly. You look good tonight. Yeah. I mean, I'm not confident, but like I said throughout like the entire offseason, I don't think it's something that's necessarily going to matter a ton. Like if the Dodgers don't win the World Series... It's not going to be because of Muncie's defense. And if they do, it's not going to be because of Muncie's defense. Like, just let him go hit his 36 homers or 37, whatever number we agreed on, and just be fine with that. This is my favorite. If he goes to Japan, he's only going to eat chicken and potatoes. That's heartbreaking. Is that accurate? Uh, You're, are you a sushi guy? No. Scott made fun of me for getting the cream cheese avocado rolls. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yes. 
If you yeah. go to Japan and order, would you be ordering cream cheese and avocado rolls? <laughs> I mean, if they have it, it's really good. It's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, Laura asking the important questions. Did you ever find the Dodger cap with Korean writing? No. Well, yes, but they wouldn't sell it because it was apparently the last one. And like they won't sell it if it's on their display rack for some reason, even though like it had the price tag and everything. So I was holding it, waiting in line to check out. And then the person comes up to me and says, you can't buy that. And like that was the third MLB store I went to, I think. And I was so disappointed. But I did end up buying it off eBay for a price that I don't feel happy about sharing. <laughs> Are we talking like 3x? The, it the was below price? that. Okay. Well, yeah, th three times the regular price, yes. More okay. than that. Crazy. Crazy. If so if any other hats? Did you get any hats there? We get a bucket hat? I, I got a bucket hat. It's just a white one, like from MLB Korea with the Dodger logo and black on it. Um, I got a DMZ hat. And I got the Dodger Soul Series, like the one with the patch on the side that they were wearing. Okay. Okay. I like it. I like it. Uh, let's do a couple more. Uh, how many? How do you think ne Yamamoto's next outing will go? Innings, runs, and strikeouts from Matthew Smith. Um, we're gonna say four and two thirds innings with three runs and six strikeouts. Wow, three runs, huh? Against the Cardinals. Yeah. That is fair there. I mean, well, I'm just thinking you're, you're high on this guy's a borderline all star. At some point, he's got a we, we need more than five innings, three earned. Yeah, I, I, like I don't expect him to come back and like figure it out immediately, like, but I expect yeah. him to take a step forward for sure. Okay. Um, I'll go five innings, two earned, dramatically different than Blake here. So big, big polar opposite pick here. And uh, I'll go four strikeouts. So there we go. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I thought there was one other question. <laughs> oh, gosh. Somebody wants. Oh, come on. I think somebody's asking me about the Oregon Ducks. I assume that's what this question is about. Yeah, Blake, congrats on your Alabama Crimson Tide advancing, by the way. I know you were locked in into what? that game. Do you say in what? Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. They just made the Sweet 16 in the NCAA tournament. For what sport? <laughs> is this a re There's no way. This has to be a bit. I, I've been sleeping like probably 30 hours in the last two days because of how tired i've been so you're a you're an alabama fan that has no idea that your team is in the sweet 16 for march madness oh the basketball tournament okay yeah that's cool yeah Jeez, it's, Roll time. it's amazing it's amazing uh if this is an oregon question um i didn't actually get to watch the game i helped out with a soccer team in portland and they had a game at the same time and it was tragic but they collapsed and choked and it seems heartbreaking. So it is heartbreaking. Seems terrible. So um, yeah, there we go. So um, all right. Well, welcome back, Blake. It's good to have you back in the United States gearing up for domestic opening day. So uh, what, you know, it's Sunday, Thursday, Thursday afternoon. You, will you be at that game? I think so. We requested it from MLB or from the Dodgers, but they have to approve it. So we'll see. Okay. Okay, there we go. Well, it's good to have you back. Get some sleep. Get your body clock right. I know you're you've got you've got sort of bizarre sleep hours anyways. You're sort of a stay up really late sleep in guy, right? Yeah, but I haven't adjusted well at all since coming back. Like it's sure. yesterday I legit slept for like 20 hours of the entire day. It's amazing. It's amazing. Well, it's good to have you back. Thanks everybody for joining us. 1200 people watching live. Thank you to those listening after the fact on Apple, Spotify, and Google on the Dodger Heads podcast. We appreciate you. If you are a podcast person, please subscribe, rate, review. Um, that would that goes a long way towards helping us. And again, stay tuned right here to the Dodger Blue YouTube page because we will have reactions to whatever comments Otani makes tomorrow about the update. You can check out DodgerBlue.com. Blake had the recap for tonight's game against the Angels. More content, more baseball, I should say, coming in the Freeway Series in the days to come. That is Blake Williams. I am Jeff Spiegel. Enjoy the rest of your night, folks. As always, go Dodgers.